In this video, I'm going to talk about online video and also video and the way that it's used in social and mobile settings. In particular, I'm going to talk about how online video is different to its broadcast equivalent and where live video fits in to this difference as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about genre and format and how you can think about that when you're starting to plan some video for the web and for social. Now, before you go any further, make sure that you have the slides for this presentation open on your computer. The slides have a number of embedded videos and links to videos, um, which I'm going to talk about as we go through the slides. The first one that I'd, want, I'd like you to watch is this um, video about a man who spent 41 hours trapped in an elevator. It's a real classic example of online video storytelling and how it's different to broadcast. One of the questions I'd like you to ask yourself as you watch this video is how would you tell this story if you were doing this for a broadcast TV show? How would you tell this story if you were making a documentary? In both cases, you would probably make some very different editorial decisions, partly because of the genres that you're working in, the genre of traditional documentary and the genre of traditional TV storytelling is different to this genre. This is a, an online video and it has its own qualities, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more depth. So I'll watch this video before you continue. Um, pause the presentation video while you're watching this. It'll only take about three minutes and then come back here. Okay, so we're talking about a different medium. We're talking about the web and social, and this means different rules. What we've got to remember with broadcast video is that all of the conventions and rules of broadcast TV um, and even film emerged in a different context. They're consumed in different ways to online, in different places, um, and online has developed its own rules. In particular, Videos online tend to fit into a number of different types. Um, some research identified five different types. You've got the link to the research down there. And these are videos that um, put you in the place where the story is happening. So something that's experiential, it gives you the experience of being there. You've got videos which give you first hand uh, footage, quite often raw footage of the events in question. You've got first person videos where the subject of the story is speaking directly to the audience in quite an intimate way that wouldn't happen uh, traditionally in broadcast. Then you've got video that shows or explains what's happening, why it's happening, how it's happened. And I'll show you some examples of this. We've had one example already of raw first hand footage being used to tell a story, the, the elevator story where someone stuck in an elevator overnight um, uses entirely CCTV footage to tell that story. And here's another example. This is a story from Birmingham Live about a robbery. We've got CCTV footage again. In both cases, that raw footage is um, complemented by some additional editorial decision making. In this example, captions have been added and some narration. In the um, previous example, the elevator example, there are captions, um, there are multiple shots on screen and there's music and there's also some use of temporality. It's worth watching that elevator again and thinking about how temporality, the timing of that story, is played with. The events don't unfold at an even pace. Those hours are compressed and extended at different points in that story. So raw footage can be a really important part of online storytelling. And part of the reason for this is that we have so much more video footage now to work with. Traditionally, we would be the only people filming, we would be the only people with access to footage, but obviously we have CCTV now uh, massively widespread and people have cameras in their pockets and their own footage that we might be able to use in our stories as well. First person storytelling involves the person speaking directly to camera. You can see this example from BBC Free. 
Now again, we've got some additional features to point out here, such as the captions. Again, very common in social storytelling because people will often have the volume turned off. And in addition to the speaking directly to the camera, we've got some cutaways and some other shots to add some variety and context and variation and pace to this story. And this um, first person approach is now creeping into broadcast TV as well. Now I've, I've already kind of touched on this, but it's worth emphasizing again that there is no need for a presenter in online storytelling. In television, the presenter serves a particular purpose, typically because we have nothing visual, but Online, we should already have something visual and we don't really, most of the time, need a presenter. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that it turns audiences off. They don't want a presenter getting in the way of the story. The other thing about online video and social video is that there is normally some sort of textual context to it. There is some text underneath the Facebook video or above the Twitter video. There is some text online above the embedded video or on YouTube. So there's always going to be some text context that introduces that video. And this is an important consideration. You must make sure that you edit the text as well as the video. And that means that they already have an idea of the story um, that you don't necessarily need a presenter to deliver. There are some exceptions to this. Snapchat and Instagram stories can work very well with presenters and you can have a personal relationship with the audience. But it's worth pointing out that most of the time you don't need a presenter and you should think about what role they play if you are planning to have one. Here are some more examples of the formats that I was mentioning. This one is a classic example of showing rather than telling. We've got a story about quicksand. I'm just going to rewind that. Um, and what we see is the quicksand that's showing us just how deep it is. So the person has been asked to demonstrate how deep it is. It's unedited. It's just one single cut. Uh, there's very little narration. There, there is no narration and there's very little dialogue. The, the person says something to camera towards the end of the film, but most of the sound is the sound of the wind and the dog barking and so on. So sometimes this is all you might want to do. You just might want to show uh, an aspect of the story. Then we have um, explaining something about a story. This is a, a video produced to explain how much money goes into the European Union. Now in broadcast, conventionally, graphics are often used to do this, but you don't need fancy on-screen graphics to produce something that explains how something works or why something happens. You can use physical analogies for your stories, so you can use real life objects. Um, this story, for example, could just as easily be illustrated by piles of biscuits and cups of tea, for example. And you can do walkthroughs. Walkthroughs are a, a very useful format in explaining how something works, where you walk through a particular um, place and point out the different things involved in that place and how they work or you get someone to do this for you. Here we've also got a, an example of a video from Glastonbury which puts you in that particular place which doesn't seem to be displaying for me so I might <laughs> leave that for now. But if you could see it, you would see that this is, as you can see from the screenshot below, walking around Glastonbury speaking to the people there. So we're putting you in the place where the story is happening. Um, the, uh, in this case, we do have a presenter because we need that role to guide us around and speak to the people involved. Another approach would be to uh, ask them in advance to speak on camera. And we might indeed get one of these people to walk us around. And that probably might be more interesting, although we'd need them to be quite professional about that. Here's another example uh, from Alastair Good, who went to the Calais camp where um, migrants uh, are staying while they're awaiting 
decisions on their status. And um, this again is a good example of being immersed in a particular location. So if you've gone to a particular location, you're able to take your viewer there and get a feel for what it's like. Alistair narrates the video. You might um, want to consider whether some captions might be needed as well. And it's well worth watching to get an idea of, of that approach and some of the editorial decisions that, that he has made in making that. Um, you'll also find a link to a, a blog post where I interviewed Alistair about the making of that video. Then we come on to live video. Live video really um, taps into a number of those properties of online video that were listed at the start of this presentation. So live video often puts you inside the space where a story is happening. Um, we often get raw footage, it's, it's unedited. Um, and so we're getting a good kind of first hand primary experience of, of some sort of event. Live video can also be used to explain things. We can do live walkthroughs and live interviews. This is an example of, of one particular um, journalist, Gemma Crew for Press Association, who's reporting on the takeoff of the world's largest aircraft. Someone else invites them to periscope it, to live stream it, and so she does. And it's worth um, watching to see a, a mistake that you want to avoid when it comes to live streaming. So if I start it, you can probably guess the mistake that's being made. Uh, Gemma is holding the phone in the landscape position. So she's uh, used to filming in landscape, but actually Periscope assumes that you're filming vertically that you're holding the phone as you normally do and so that the image has been tilted on screen. On Periscope itself this would be righted, it would be accounted for but um, either way it's just a, a good example of making sure that if you are live streaming on something like Periscope you're probably going to want to use the vertical orientation for your audience that's also going to be on mobile. On Facebook Live, of course, it's going to be more uh, horizontal, more, more landscape. Here's another example to look at in terms of things to avoid. This is a Facebook Live interview with the author, Margaret Atwood. And um, a, a number of things to, to look for when you watch this. First of all, watch it and see if there are any things you think could have been improved about the way it was set up. Now, a couple of uh, good things to point out. First of all, we have a microphone, so the audio is nice and clear. And audio is a really important part of social video. We've also got a good description here with some linking and an invitation to send your questions below, even a couple of emojis to make it nice and visual. So those are some good things. But in terms of the actual um, shot, the lighting is really quite odd. Uh, we've positioned the subject near a window and actually she's not too badly lit, but generally the, the whole thing is, isn't brilliantly lit and you might want to find a better position to film that. The other is the steadiness of the shots. Now we've got a movement of the shot from the kind of establishing shot here into the two-person shot here so we do need to move the camera but you might consider using a tripod or something else to create a steadier shot. Note for example though that not having a tripod does mean you have that flexibility to switch from a three-person shot to a two-person shot to a to a as we come up a one-person shot back to a two-person shot three-person and so on. So you can have a bit more variety of shot if you've got that control, but it's thinking about how you do that and maintain a steadiness of shot. And one other example to show you, this is um, a live video 
uh, also from the BBC, of uh, a makeup artist giving makeup tips to other women living with cancer. And this is actually playing at the moment, but you'll notice that there's nothing on screen. And in fact, if I go 30 seconds in, oops, it's still not live. And eventually, at this point, It's now started. So make sure you live when you go live. You've not got this kind of dead air at the start. Um, also, this is very much a broadcast shot. Uh, online, you're probably going to want to go a little bit tighter because it's a smaller screen. Uh, in some cases, it will be a mobile phone screen. So you're going to consider the audience being different to that broadcast audience. So some considerations to point out here. First of all, just because it's live doesn't mean it's unplanned. Um, you can prepare and should prepare for going live. Part of that involves considering audio. If you've got some sort of microphone that you can plug into your phone, then that will make a massive difference to the quality of the video. Even a hands-free uh, with the microphone on there can be used as a replacement for the built-in microphone. And make sure you're close enough to the subject that you're filming so you do get good audio if you're not using a microphone. As well as you being prepared, you need to make sure the audience is prepared too. That means trailing the fact that you're going to be going live on Facebook itself, but also on other platforms as well. Build your audience and get them ready for the, the live stream itself. And finally, consider the platform that you're going live on and whether it's going to be defaulting to vertical like Periscope or landscape as in Facebook Live. Um, I'll come back to this example to illustrate this point. This is uh, the, the Glastonbury live video that I mentioned earlier. Here we do have a video, a, a microphone. In fact, what she's holding up is, is a very small lapel mic to, in order to capture decent um, audio for the live stream. And here's an example of preparation and the role of preparation in live video and um, preparing your audience. At the bottom, you can see the text saying that they're live. Ask us those basic questions about the European Union. We're in Liverpool with these people. So they've lined up some guests. And that's um, part of the preparation. It's not just going into the street cold. We've got a number of people, experts, contributors, sources involved in this story and we're going to involve them in the live video. Um, at the top left there we've got uh, Newsnight's day of Facebook Live. So this was on the, the day after the EU referendum. Newsnight actually did Facebook Live streams all day uh, as a follow-up to that story looking at different dimensions of that. So again lots of planning here, actual scheduling of Facebook Lives throughout the day with different guests, different journalists and different topics. So the political ramifications, how the result is going down in the North East, what's happening in Westminster, what's happening in Scotland and so on. Having a clear angle for each of those Facebook Lives and preparing for that and preparing the audience as well. This was a graphic which was shared widely on social to try and build an audience and bring them into that uh, Facebook Live or those Facebook Lives. Facebook themselves have given a number of tips on doing a good Facebook Live. They include similar points about telling people ahead of time that you're going to be going live, writing a compelling description for your Facebook Live. So again, the text around your video is part of the quality of your online video. It's not just about the video itself, but the title of the video, the description, any tags and so on that you might add. They advise people to uh, ask viewers to follow you and receive notifications so they're aware when you go live. They recommend going live when you have a strong connection, so make sure you check that you're going to have a good internet connection. And they recommend engaging with commenters by name and responding to them. Um, one thing you'll have noticed in a lot of the examples we showed was inviting people to comment and ask questions, but you must make sure you're monitoring that and responding to it in order to stimulate that discussion. This is another way 
in which online video is fundamentally different from broadcast. It's often interactive, communal, it involves working with your audience and involving them in the content itself. Facebook say that if you broadcast for longer, you should reach more people. And they've said, just be creative and go live often. There's a lot of different ways you can go live. It doesn't have to be a, a, an event. It can be anything um, that works as a live format. So I'd like you to, um, as an exercise, to explore some of these ideas. Do this now for a story. Think about the five different types of online video, the five different reasons why you might use online video, and how you might use those reasons for your story. So ask yourself, how would you put the viewer in the place where the story is happening? Is there a way that you can create some sort of video that's experiential, like the Glastonbury video, like the Calais Camp video, where you take them to the site of the story? Secondly, uh, might there be some first-hand video, some raw video, CCTV footage, for example, or footage on someone's phone that might be useful, that might be used for your video? Third, um, is there someone in your story who could provide a first-person perspective? Could they talk directly to camera in some way and tell part of the story that way? Fourth, um, is there something in your story that you might need to show? Or fifth, that you might explain. So it might be something simple like the quicksand example, something very visual about your story that you want to take some footage of, or it might be some sort of process involved in the story, how something works, why something happens, that you can create a video explainer for. So pick a story that you've written in the past or a story that you'd like to do now, that you're planning to do, and Try and go through each of these five questions and see if it can help you to generate ideas for your story. If you want some more ideas, um, there's a, an article on in publishing which identifies 12 video archetypes. These are basically genres of video um, which also might give you some more ideas. And they include how-to videos, um, so a video that explains how to do something. We have screen captures, so videos that are entirely of what's taking place on the screen of a computer. So again, that might be a, a how-to. Videos that take you behind the scenes. This might be behind the scenes of your own um, storytelling process or your own filming process or uh, information gathering process. But um, they also might be behind the scenes of the subject that you're telling a story about. Likewise, you can do backgrounders on particular aspects of the story. Animation is another area that's uh, increasingly easy to do online. There's a number of online tools. One is Powtoon. Um, I'll bring that up in the browser so you can see what I mean. Uh, and this makes it easy to create animated videos. You can create time lapses. Um, you can look ahead to some sort of event or round up what happened at an event, or indeed you can go to an event and do some video about that. So those are just some genre ideas as well to think about. Finally then, um, one thing that's worth listening to is this podcast by the BBC Academy on live social video, where you can hear from um, Sarah Brown from Facebook, uh, Andy Dangerfield from BuzzFeed, and Mark Frankel, who's an expert in mobile video, talking about those particular challenges.